All right. Uh, good morning. Your flood control assignment is due on Thursday, and we'll go over some calculations in class today that I think will finalize what you need to know in order to solve that assignment. Um, for your final exam, it's going to begin at 8 a.m. on Tuesday the 11th, so bright and early. Um, I'll try and uh, bring in some snacks. So uh, don't stay up all night, you know, drinking or whatever, because then you won't have any uh, appetite for what I bring and, you know. <laughs> all right, so on the exam, it's going to be the same basic format as we've had in prior tests, where at first there's some short answer and concept type questions and then problem solving. And uh, you're permitted to prepare one page of notes and equations to use on the second part of the exam. Uh, and then you need to be computer ready on the day of the test, so you'll potentially be solving uh, problems where you need the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's likely that you'll have a WMS question. And um, the, the test is comprehensive. A greater number of the points are earned on the recent material since the second midterm, but uh, I could potentially throw a StormCAD or a HY8 question into the mix. And so you need to uh, be prepared to solve any of those problem types. And uh, then you'll be submitting your files using MU Online. And so you need to make sure whatever computer you bring, it's able to connect to Marshall's uh, wireless network. Any questions on the announcements? All right. So yeah, go ahead. It could be anything, yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, that list of terms, uh, terminology that I gave you. I feel like I haven't asked enough of those, you know. So it could be anything. All right. uh, last time where we left off was uh, we had taken a look at some of the uh, um, the river flow and precipitation data that's available on that water.weather.gov, but let's take a look at the map service center that FEMA makes available for floodplain mapping. It allows you to generate some PDFs that are pretty interesting um, where you put in an address and then it'll generate an assessment of the risk of flooding at that address. And so uh, anybody want to give me an address, maybe your aunt and uncle or your grandparents or uh, here in Huntington itself is kind of boring because of the flood wall. So I wouldn't ask for your address if you live in this area, but. All right. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. So you can see what it's doing is it is breaking this up into areas where uh, it's the floodway, so close to the river. That's where they expect during a 100-year uh, um, storm, the water is going to be completely inundated, not only the floodway, uh, but then you can see that there are other areas where they're designating here in the hashed kind of uh, tannish color, where there's a 0.2 annual chance of flooding. Um, and then the, uh, the areas that are shaded in blue represent where during the 100-year storm it's going to be inundated. Now, the, the PDFs that you can generate, all right, so um, let's do dynamic map. Hopefully this will load. It's creating what's called a firmet, and the firmet is a a PDF that you can save that has all of the definitions built into it. It's got the location. Uh, so here's the address that's identified, the key. And um, if we wanted to print that, then we could make a PDF out of it. So that is how you generate a, uh, a firm. And on the assignment, I ask you to address a, uh, to, to look up a couple of addresses in Milton and try and understand how they're different. You know, they're kind of varying proximity to the river in Milton and are have different levels of threat assessment. Now, 
what I had to remove from this list of websites in the past, FEMA had uh, really easy access to the flood insurance rates where it was pretty simple to calculate what the flood insurance premiums were going to be for a certain classification. Uh, but they've taken that off of the FEMA website and now if you want to know what the flood insurance rates are, you have to get a quote from um, some of the, I think they have servicing companies that actually collect the premiums and uh, process any sort of claims. Um, but the, the premiums can vary quite a lot where uh, a home that is outside of an area that's designated as flood prone, and so here in these unshaded areas, the flood premiums could be, you know, maybe $500 a year, whereas if you're living in these areas that are flood prone, the premiums could be $4,000 a year. I mean, it's really about an order of magnitude uh, to live in the area that is inside of the 100-year floodplain versus outside of the 100-year floodplain. So it's kind of interesting how much it changes. All right, so that map service center is something that you're going to have to uh, use for the assignment. Um, this picture of flooding is uh, from in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. And it shows just uh, a bunch of wrecked vehicles, a muddy sidewalk, muddy yards. And uh, one of the problems that they had with the flooding in Hurricane Katrina was that um, there are a lot of um, toxic tailing ponds from the chemical industry in Louisiana along the coastline. Uh, there's a big oil and gas and chemical industry on the coast. And uh, a, a lot of those waste ponds got washed in inland and spread out over a pretty wide area. And so it wasn't just the, uh, the water affecting drywall and ruined carpets uh, that was an issue, but there was a, a kind of like a secondary damage in the form of all this toxic waste that now had to be identified and cleaned up. And so what this picture illustrates is the range of different categories of harm people can suffer when there's flooding. Um, when a flood like this has occurred, then people are going to be less interested in this neighborhood because now it's known as being flood prone. And so um, that can lead to like a reduction in property values and it can decrease the amount of property tax that the, um, that the municipality is able to collect on people in this area if the base property values decrease as well. Uh, so the book identifies a couple of different damage categories and direct damage is the one that's the easiest to think of. It's the damage that's caused by the water itself and the cost of repairing things that have been directly affected by the flooding. Um, but these other cost categories of damage are a little bit more abstract. And so if you think about the uh, business revenue that's lost while things are uh, either shut down or underwater or while things are being repaired, uh, businesses aren't selling gasoline. They're not selling hamburgers. And I remember uh, driving through um, the floods that they had in West Virginia back in uh, 2016, I drove through a town that's really close to uh, the Greenbrier. Was it White Sulphur Springs? Yeah, I, drew, I was driving home from D.C. and I didn't, I mean, I knew there was a flood, but I didn't know like the whole town was basically evacuated because we were just looking for something to eat and we drove into White Sulphur Springs and just nothing was open at all. And so, you know, that lost business revenue is the indirect damage of the flood, where even if someone was up on the hillside and didn't have any water damage, then they're still affected by the fact that everyone else is either evacuated or the lack of access. Um, secondary damage is the adverse effects of people who depend on output from a certain area. And so uh, you may know Alcon on Route 2. It's on the left side as you're driving northbound on Route 2. And so let, and that's you know, adjacent to the Ohio River. So if the Ohio River got really high and Alcon was flooded, then people who depend on whatever's happening there at Al Alcon, they make interocular lenses there. And so I think those are like replacement lenses that go into people's eyes during surgery. And so if there happened to be some sort of a global shortage on interocular lenses uh, because of flooding in that location, then the people who can't get what they need would be uh, uh, experiencing secondary damage. Um, and so we all experience secondary damage when there is a hurricane or flooding on the Gulf Coast because the cost of fuel goes up. 
and there are these periodic spikes after a hurricane or after a refinery disaster. But, I mean, you can um, detect that there are effects due to flooding. Um, the cost of plywall and building materials can go up when there's a lot of flooding and damage in coastal areas, and so now suddenly there's a big demand, so the, the supply in other places decreases, and so prices can go up. And so that's an illustration of the types of secondary damage that can arise from flood damage where you're thinking, well, thank goodness I didn't live in the flood zone, my house is safe, but still, you know, you've got a few dollars that you're having to pay because of the secondary damage that can occur. Intangible damage is uh, the damage that's difficult to quantify on a dollar basis. You know, these are the disbenefits where um, an area is muddy and smells bad after a flood. Um, or it could be the social well-being that's lost. You know, people couldn't go to the baseball games that they were expecting to because now they're just uh, shoveling mud for days at a time. Uh, the reduction in aesthetic value. With driving through White Sulphur Springs after the flood, it just it wasn't as nice a place probably as it was before the flood. Uh, and so uh, that reduction in, uh, in the previous aesthetic quality of an area is classified as intangible damage because it's tough to put a dollar value on all of that. But then you'd think after all of these previous categories, we would have uh, exhausted all the different ways that flooding can cause damage. But there's also the uncertainty where businesses will intentionally avoid areas that are um, under a threat of flooding. Um, or if there's been a flood, then people are less willing to build there in the future. Um, and, and it also limits the economic development. And so if you think about one of the reasons why West Virginia is kind of like chronically poor compared to the rest of the United States, you remember that we, uh, we read that article that was saying that rivers and the overlying river and agricultural networks in the United States is part of what makes America perpetually rich. And so West Virginia is poor in both of those things. It's poor in flat land where agricultural crops can grow. And what l limited flat land is available in a lot of places is immediately adjacent to streams. And so there's not going to be a lot of development in areas that are flood prone. And then everything else is like 45% slopes that's really tough to uh, put a crop onto. And so uh, you could say that there's some uncertainty damage that we face here in the state because a lot of the areas, we're lucky to have some confl flood control structure where there's dams um, that help to eliminate the risk of flooding, but uh, there are still plenty of places that are affected when there's flooding. And so there's a failure to develop economically because of that uncertainty. OK, so remember these relationships, these models that we talked about last time. And for each of these models, you need to think about what goes into the model, so the independent variable, and what comes out of the model. And so what we're going to have is the independent variable will be on the horizontal axis, and the dependent variable will be on the vertical axis. And so a hydrologic model is going to allow us to put in some return period, or in other words, an exceedance frequency, and then you know, the curve or the, the sloped line, or maybe it's a flat line, but basically we bounce off of that and get a certain flow rate. And so you could prepare this curve by running uh, WMS and a HEC1 model or a TR55 model. You could do it for the two year, the five year, the 10 year, the 25. And then you could make a curve that connects all of those flow rates. And so you'd have a different number of return periods and then you'd have all these flow rates. And so now you've got a model that connects the discharge versus return period. And so what comes out of that is the flow rate. And then you take that flow rate and you put it into another model, the hydraulic model. And the way that you'd create this curve is you'd take a program like HEC-RAS, or you could do the calculations manually. You remember at the end of hydraulic engineering uh, last semester, what we were doing was we were doing open channel calculations like the uh, numerical integration method, the standard step method, where you were taking a known depth at a certain location and you were working upstream by looking at the slope of the energy grade line, the channel slope. And so uh, you knew at a certain distance upstream what's going to be the depth for a flow rate. And so this curve is just for a flow rate, how deep is the water? And you run it for a lot of different 
flow rates. And so essentially, you know for the two-year storm, how deep will the water be? Because the hydrologic model told you the discharge, and the hydraulic model told you the depth. So we essentially know how deep the water will be how often. You know, maybe once every 10 years, the water depth will be 10 feet. Once every 50 years, the water depth will be 12 feet. And then this final model, we put in, for a certain depth, how much damage do we experience? And so stage versus damage. The input, the independent variable is the depth. And then this economic model, someone, a surveyor, has gone out and identified you know, at what elevation are different structures. And then we have from the tax data the appraised value of every structure. And so you know if the water level gets to a certain depth, how many of the structures in a given region are going to be underwater from that survey. And then the economic data uh, comes from maybe the assessor's office. And so we can know every two years how much property is underwater. Every five years how much property is underwater. Every 10 years how much damage is there going to be due to flooding. So the method that we're going to go through today as an example is we're going to calculate uh, for different structural measures how much of that damage can be reduced. You know, if we have this uh, this baseline understanding of the amount of damage we're going to experience and how often we're going to have that damage, then different structural measures like dikes, levees, diversions, reservoirs, those things have a different amount of protection. And so we'll calculate how much reduction in damage each one of them provides. And then we'll calculate the annualized damage savings. And that's what makes this a little bit tricky is uh, there's some probability involved in trying to take um, an event that's only going to happen once every 10 years, and you're trying to spread the cost of that event over every year. And you may remember from um, economic uh, engineering economy that you can have some cost that's a known present value, and you can find an annual value from that. Do you remember the time value of money calculations where you have some given P? So if P is given and you want to know A, then there are tables where you can find, find A given P for some interest rate and for N number of years. Maybe you remember that. Maybe you'll learn it again as you prepare for the uh, FE exam. But uh, what we'll do is we'll annualize the damage savings. And so rather than saying, you know, this if we put in the diversion, it's going to prevent the 10-year storm. And so rather than taking that savings only one time uh, in a 10-year period, you say, well, what's the annual value of that savings? Because it's damage that didn't occur. And so the benefit is experienced every year. It's not just experienced uh, once every 10 years, because you don't know exactly right now, you don't know when that 10-year storm was going to come. Uh, now, to go through that process of calculating the annual damage savings, we have to consider the incremental probability, which uh, I think is best explained once we're actually looking at the example. But the idea is incremental probability is how much probability is there between the two-year storm, for instance, and the five-year storm. You know, the two-year storm, in any given year, there's a 50% chance. The five-year storm, in any given year, there's a 20% chance. So between those two, there's 30% of probability between the 50% chance and the 20% chance. And so the incremental probability is looking at the area under a probability curve. It's pretty abstract, but it'll make more sense as we're actually crunching the numbers. Uh, the damage reduction is looking at um, whether you can build a small diversion or a big diversion, which is to say you could build a diversion that provides protection against the 10-year storm, or you could build a really big diversion that provides protection against the 25-year storm. And so not only are we comparing different alternatives, but we can also compare different sizes of alternatives, because everything's going to have a different cost. You know, the larger diversion diversion is going to cost more than the small one. And so 
uh, one of the example questions we're going to look at today is how to know how big to build something. And, uh, and so to do that, you're going to look at the damage reduction that's saved when you go from uh, preventing the five-year storm and now preventing the 10-year storm, for example. So that's what the delta D is going to be. And then uh, the annual expected flood reduction, what it does is it says there is a certain amount of damage that's avoided every year and a certain probability that that storm was going to happen. And so you combine it all together. You know, there, is, there was a 10% chance that this was going to happen and a 20% chance that that was going to happen. And you add up all of the things that were prevented. You know, if you're building to the 25-year storm, you're protecting against the 25-year storm. So you now can avoid the damage of the two. You're dam uh, avoiding the damage of the five, the 10, uh, everything below in size, uh, below and including the 25 has been avoided. And so you get to kind of accumulate all of those probabilities and all of the costs. OK, there is a, an Excel file uh, on MU Online. It's a starting file, just so that you don't have to type all of the uh, spreadsheet in from scratch. Uh, so go to MU Online and download that Excel file. And we'll work through it together to, uh, to illustrate this example. It's at the bottom of the uh, front page. <coughs> OK. So let's look at the data that we're, we're given to begin this example. Um, we have exceedance probabilities, which correspond to storms of different sizes. And so for example, a 20% exceedance probability, that goes along with a five-year storm. Because that means in any given year, there's a 20% chance that you'll experience the five-year storm. Uh, the 10% probability, that goes along with the 10-year storm. Because in any given year, there's not only a 20% uh, uh, chance of the 5-year storm, but there's also a 10% chance of the 10-year storm. So we are exposed to all of the probabilities cumulatively. There are threats coming from every direction. Um, the existing condition is this is how much damage we experience in millions of dollars for a storm of a certain size. So you can see that the five-year storm causes no damage right now. But the 10-year storm, if it occurs, we're going to have $6 million of damage. Uh, if the, let's see, 5%, that would go along with the 20-year storm, right? Yeah, 20-year storm. So if there's a 20-year storm, then that will cost us $13 million of damage and so on and so forth. Now, one, one of the things that we don't see immediately is you think about like the 1,000-year storm. So that 0.1 exceedance probability, that's the 1,000-year storm. Well, $54 million is a lot. But there's only a 1 in 1,000 chance that's going to happen. And so actually, on an annual basis, the, the threat of that 1,000-year storm is pretty small because the risk is spread out over 1,000 years. So when we go through these calculations, what we're going to see is it's, it's not these really um, rare big events that threaten us the most on an annual basis. When you're adding up the annualized cost of damage, it's kind of these smaller and middle range storms that are providing the most risk. Because in other words, I'd rather have a 7% like, if, think of it, if, what if you were going to win the lottery? I'd rather have a 7% chance at $10 million than a 0.1% chance of $54 million. Um, so if you're going to look at the, uh, the damage per event, we'll, we'll see that it's not these huge events that give us the most trouble. All right, so now consider there's four structural al alternatives that are being selected, or considered. There's the dike, and the way the dike is working 
is that if it's in place, we don't experience the 10-year storm, and then we also don't experience this 7% storm, 7% probability. But then any storm bigger than that, it's as though the dike was never there. So we experience the full brunt of the storm for anything larger than the 7% probability. But then some of these others uh, change the relationship slightly. Like the diversion, not only do you, uh, with the diversion, you prevent more of the storms, like you're only seeing any, wa any damage at the 5% probability, but now it's also less damage. Instead of the 13 million with the diversion, you're only seeing 6 million once there begins to be any damage. So does everybody understand this first table? This is what's given in the, uh, uh, the top part of the example one tab. Now, there's uh, four different alternatives, but for each one of these, it's just a certain size. Uh, it's the next example well, where we'll be considering different sized alternatives. So what we're saying is uh, a dike of a certain size is going to perform this way. We could have built a different dike. Like, we could have made the walls higher. And if we built a different dike with higher walls, then that maybe wouldn't have had the $13 million worth of damage in the 5% uh, storm. But this is just for a diversion of a certain size, a dike of a certain size, a reservoir of a certain size. And so what we're going to try and do is find out the expected annualized benefit. So we want to know which one is best of these four options. Which one is best? Which one delivers on an annual basis the most benefit? So the first step is to assemble expected damage cost versus exceedance probability data. And that's given to you already. Now, in the real world, this is maybe a table that you'd need to assemble. And so there would be a lot of work going into this. Because what you'd need to do is you'd need to assess how each of these four structural measures are performing. So you'd need to find out you know, the dike, uh, what properties are now going to be protected versus threatened when the dike is in place, um, the diversion, and so on. You'd have to uh, essentially evaluate all of them to generate this data. And so it would not be negligible to prepare this table. But once you have it, what you can do is you can calculate the damage reduction versus this do-nothing existing alternative. So we're going to find out how much damage is avoided versus the exceedance probability. So let's actually do that. Um, you can see step two in this table I've provided. We want to find the damage reduction compared to existing. Now, the existing isn't there because existing compared to itself is obviously zero. But I've given you in the dike an illustration of what the calculation is. It's the uh, existing minus the dike for each one of these. And so this is how much damage is avoided if you do the thing. And so fill in the rest of the table. There's some blanks here for the diversion and the channel modification. But each one of them is going to be the existing versus the thing that's being compared. And so you subtract to fill in that table. OK, so let's take a look at the channel modification. If we do channel modification, then it's going to save $6 million worth of damage during the 10% uh, storm. During the 7% storm, it's going to save $10 million worth of damage. During the 5% storm, you're going to be saving 
nine million dollars. And so essentially by building this thing, this is money that you can, you can consider as revenue or income, you know, an avoidance of uh, amounts that you're going to have to pay if it occurred. So any questions with step two? All right. Now, the incremental probability. Down here at the bottom, I explain what the incremental probability is. And so um, I use the illustration as the, uh, the difference between the 20% and the 10% exceedance probability then uh, as a fraction that's the 20 minus the 10 divided by 100 so there's 0.1 probability between the 20 percent and the 10 percent storm and the reason why we're calculating that is we want to find out what's the average damage reduction in that increment and so here for the dike what we've got is uh, this first step is between the 20 percent and the 10 percent and so the increment is 0.1 and then the average damage reduction that I have of 3 is the average of there's zero damage reduction for the 20 percent storm and six million dollars of damage reduction if we build the dike and if we experience the 10 percent storm and so the average of that increment is 3 we're just taking the simple average there and the size of the increment here we can say is 0.1. So I've gone through all of those calculations for the dike and kind of shown the beginning pattern for the diversion and channel modification. And so for each of those remaining blank fields, calculate the delta F for the incremental probability and the delta D. Now let me caution you that this isn't just plugging numbers into a spreadsheet template. You kind of have to really understand. It's, it's more important to understand what it means um, because you know if you have a problem like this on the exam you're going to be re reproducing it from scratch you may have notes on your spreadsheet that says you know like what these steps are but um, the point is is um, just being able to find the formula and drag the formula down through the rest of the cells isn't enough to really understand this and so let's take a moment to make sure that it kind of makes conceptual sense I give you down here in the bottom is the sum of delta T times delta F. And so for the dike, that column should be 0.64. See if you can figure out how to do that for the diversion, channel modification, and reservoir. What you're doing is you're summing up each of the individual delta T, uh, delta D times delta F. Okay, calculating this is tedious because what you have to do is you have to multiply the 3 times the 0.1 and add it to 8 times 0.3 plus 5 times 0 0.02, 0 times 0 0.03, and so on. So you have to, first of all, multiply them all together and then add it all up. And so the formula is going to look like this times that plus that 
times that plus this times that. So we're multiplying them together and adding them to sum it up. And then let's see, if I anchor all of the references in the A column, then I'll be able to drag the uh, formula to the right. So let me go through and press F4 for all of the references to the A column. Okay, it's all anchored. Fingers crossed it works. All right, so 0 0.640 million. And we'll talk about what that is in just a minute. But to uh, drag that sideways now, it looks like the best option is the reservoir, because you want the most damage reduction. So how much of this do you get to credit every year is what the delta F column is calculating. So in any given year, you're going to experience 10% of the $3 million savings. Because that's, that's like the size of that probability on an annual basis. And in any given year, you get to take 3% of the $8 million savings because the uh, you know, the $8 million savings doesn't occur every year, but we want to know the annual um, damage reduction. So this is going to be the annual expected benefit from the damage that is avoided. And so to annualize these, we're having to consider the incremental probability, which is the size between different storms. Uh, in the end, you can see that the one with the highest annual expected benefit is the uh, reservoir. So this sized reservoir is going to save every year 1.378 million. Now we don't know how much this reservoir is going to cost on an annual basis. Um, if the cost is more than 1.378 million dollars, then you may have to reconsider whether to build it. Um, of course, remember that it's not always just uh, the direct costs that should be considered. Uh, because we were talking about you know, the direct cost of flooding, but then there's also uh, some of those secondary effects, like the reduction in uh, people's willingness to develop an area, the secondary damage for people who are inconvenienced when there's the, uh, the damage. And so if we could somehow work those uh, fuzzier uh, more difficult to quantify factors into these reductions in damage, then that may increase the savings any, even more. Um, so if you uh, lose track of how this works, I've tried to uh, put as good an explanation as I can um, here at the bottom. And this is an example that comes from the textbook, though. Uh, it was a rare example that I feel like the textbook really dropped the ball. It just didn't explain it in uh, enough detail to make it clear what was happening. So are there any questions on this illustration? I think that uh, for the homework assignment, you're doing basically the same thing. Um, and I think that on the homework assignment, I've given you a link to a video. Is that right? Like on the equation, uh, on the homework assignment page? Uh, where is that? Yeah, so 
um, you may want to take a look at that video over, over the long run. It would probably save you time to watch that if it's not immediately obvious what you need to do. All right, so I alluded to the fact that this is only calculating the, uh, the benefits, but we also need to factor in the cost of providing certain levels of protection. So before we move on to this next example, are there any questions about this one? All right, to uh, maximize benefit, you minimize your cost. And cost is coming from two things. The cost is coming from the damage, and it's also coming from how much you pay for a certain level of protection. And so that's the total cost. And the, uh, the approach for you know, whether to build a diversion that protects against the five-year storm versus the 10-year storm is you add up the costs, each of these two categories, and you find whichever has the lowest. And, uh, and whichever one has the lowest is also going to be the one that maximizes the annual benefit. And so the annual benefit is thought of as the uh, savings compared to the flooding with no structural measure in place. And so the net benefit would be the difference between the, uh, the reduction in damage and the cost that you're paying. And we'll look at each of these categories as we work through the next example. But before we do, uh, consider this figure. What this is showing is, first of all, this is the damage, the, the curve that speaks to, uh, for a low probability event, there's lots of flood damage cost. And uh, for an event that happens frequently, like maybe the two-year storm, there's less damage cost associated with that. So this curve is saying it's the costs related to flood damage. And then the other component of total costs is the cost of building things to prevent the flood damage. And so that's what this first cost curve is. And so uh, the, uh, the design level, if you're going to design against a really big storm, then your first cost is going to be high. Uh, and you can expect that the damage cost you're going to experience with a really high design level. So if you're building a really sophisticated structure that will protect against the 100-year storm, for example, now you're not having very much damage cost, but your construction costs are high. And so this total cost curve, what you should be doing is working to minimize the total cost curve, so finding the lowest point in here. Um, it's similar to uh, in engineering economy when you do uh, a cost effectiveness analysis where you're trying to minimize the annual expense. Um, you're, you're picking how long to own something or which level of construction to do by the, the overall lowest cost of ownership. And so thinking, using a car as an analogy, um, you, know, you can buy a car that costs very little now, but then it's going to take more in maintenance and repairs as it's being used. Or you can spend more now, and there's going to be less of those maintenance and repair expenses. And so you want to balance that idea of buying, spending a lot now and less in the future. You need to balance in, with um, structural measures. You want to balance. Um, not building, like not providing too much protection where the first costs overwhelm the damage, but trying to balance the both together to minimize the, uh, the risk. Okay, now this is another example that comes from the book, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of staring to kind of figure out what they are uh, talking about in this data table that's provided. And so uh, here's how I think to interpret this table. What we have right now is a system that's providing protection against the five-year storm. Um, uh, we don't have to spend anything to get the existing level of protection. Um, but on average, right now, with the, uh, the five-year storm protection that we've got, we experience $1.94475 million of damage per year. So that is the amount of damage that comes to us from all of the storms that's larger than the five-year storm. So remember that even if you pro provide protection against the five-year storm, you're still threatened by the 10, the 25, the 50, and all of those other big ones. And so what this annual damage represents is all of the storms that are larger than the row that you're on. So if we have five-year protection, we don't have protection against all these other storms. Now, since we already have five-year protection, it costs you nothing to get it, because it's already owned. But if you're willing to spend 
$0.2 million per year so that you have protection against the 10-year storm, then what that means is that now you're only exposed to damage from all of the storms bigger than the 10-year storm. So you're threatened by the 20, the 50, the 100, and so on, all the way down through the list. And so what that means is if you spend $0.2 million per year, now your annual damage is only $1.64475 million per year. So already we can tell that's a good deal because you're spending $0.2 million a year and you've just reduced your flood damage from 1.94 to 1.64. So in other words, you spent $0.2 million and then you reduce your damage by $0.3 million. And so the rule is you should always spend the additional dollar if you're saving more than you're spending. So should you spend $0.2 million to save $0.3 million? Absolutely. So keep buying the next largest alternative until the incremental cost is outweigh, it outweighs the incremental benefit. Then you shouldn't uh, build the next level down. So what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this situation to figure out uh, how big should we choose. Should we choose the 10-year? Should we choose the 20-year? Should we choose the 50-year level of protection? And that, uh, that um, example is on the second tab of the template file that I provided. And so what we're going to do is calculate the total cost, um, which includes both the damage and the cost of providing protection. So these two columns can be thought of as the two curves that make the total cost curve. So there's the cost of constructing the structural measure, and there's the cost of the damage. And so we want to know the total cost by adding these two columns together for each year. And then the benefit is going to be the reduced damage compared to the existing protection. And then we also want to do the net benefit. All right, so that is here on the example two. So the total cost you can see is the damage and the annual cost together. So we'll calculate that column down. The benefit is the difference between the uh, annual damage from the existing condition and the annual damage of the row that you're on. And then the net benefit is the annual benefit minus the annual cost. So how big should we build this, uh, what was it again? A, uh, it's a dike system. Well, if we want to maximize the benefit, that tells us that if we build protection against the 50-year storm, then that's going to uh, minimize the damage compared to every year having $1.94 million worth of damage, we're only going to have $1.649 million worth of damage. And to get that big reduction in damage, we only have to spend $1 million per year to do it. And so the total cost, where you're adding together the damage expense and the annual expense of having that dike system in place, you're going to have to pay something. You can either pay for the flooding, you can pay for a dike, or some combination of the two. But this is the one that has the minimum cost for each year. This is only direct cost, right? It's not really looking at direct cost and effectiveness. It depends on what's going into these damage estimates. I mean, uh, in this example, it doesn't really specify in the book. But um, let's just pretend that it's including the direct and indirect costs. Uh, and that those have been realistic estimates. Because you can goose the numbers any way you want. Like if you say that and it's worth $1,000 an hour not to have to shovel mud out of your front driveway, then, you know, then it's going to seem like you should build the biggest dike in the world. But um, 
here the, the biggest differential between the uh, cost and the damage reduction also corresponds to the largest net benefit. So the net benefit is saying the difference between the uh, benefit and the costs. And so it's like you're compared to the baseline situation, you're coming out $295,000 per year ahead, because this is in millions. So if you, if you find someone to finance this for you, like a, a bank, uh, or you can take out bonds to build the structural measure, then it's essentially free money. Then you're saving 295000 Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the people who um, are threatened by flooding may not be the same ones that are being asked to pay for the cost of the structural measure. So if you live up on a hillside in a town and the people who live in the low-lying areas are trying to get everyone to chip in equally, then that's a bad deal for you uh, because you're not going to be enjoying the direct benefits of the flood re reduction. But um, you know, there are all those secondary factors where if you can't drive through the roads and if your, uh, your grocery store is underwater and your employer is underwater, the fact that your house isn't directly in the floodplain uh, is great, but it's, it's not like you've avoided all of the damage altogether. Okay. Well, one last thing I wanted to show you was some pictures that Ashton provided me with of that uh, tiny house that's being built out on Route 2. So, you know, this approach to avoiding damage is just that you figure how high is the water going to be, and you make that lower level of the structure unoccupied space. And so uh, that's going to be maybe where tools or cars or vehicles are, and then it's only the uh, upper part of the structure that's going to be habited. And I wish you could get a sense of how small this act actually is. It maybe doesn't seem small, but you kind of get a feel for it. If this is the width of a door, then the, uh, the house is only, what, maybe like six times wider than a doorway. And so uh, by having relatively flood-proof building materials like cinder block walls down beneath and then not having any of the OSB or wood until you're at the elevation that you wouldn't expect to see water very often, then it's kind of a smart way to use land for r residential use that otherwise is... Uh, too risky to build on is just elevate the structure. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, like, so what if the flooding happens at night? It seems like they're going to have to have a boat, you know, like up in the rafters, because it would be easy to get isolated, right? And uh, and maybe you know, well, there's only a one percent chance the water is going to get any higher than my. Uh, than this level, but still you're stuck. You know, like if, if the water's just up to here, the, the top of the garage, then you're going to have to canoe back to <laughs> civilization. So anyways. All right, well, that's it for today. I'll see you on Thursday. Reminder that that homework assignment is due on Thursday. So if you have any problems, uh, please let me know. Stop by during my office hours, and I'd be glad to help you out.